your seat in its upright position, and uh, buckle up because you're about to experience the funniest Bible study in the history of the universe. Greg Perry, the most interesting author in the world, unleashes rip splitting insight from the most important book ever written. While Perry is the masculine theologian, he's also joyful, gleeful, playful, grateful, whimsical, and always biblical. Here you get the Super Bowl of Bible study, the Stradivarius of podcasts, and the Armageddon of truth. And while you're laughing, <laughs> he may just scare you off the path to hell. And here's the man you are waiting for. Well, it's his podcast after all. Greg Perry. Yeah, the train ride of truth tracking toward you. I am your ever-loving host, Greg Perry, with Dexter. He's my sound guy. We're back with another Gregcast, podcast, broadcast, Godcast, reminding you that every episode broadcasts in a 100% completely judgment-free zone. And we ask that you honor our request for a judgment-free zone by never charging money to judge others. And we promise that we will never charge you or anyone else money when we judge and rebuke you. Judgment-free, rebuke-free, all the time. This is our three-parters conclusion, the podcast to end all podcasts, the conclusion of our already legendary series, Herman Munster Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics describes the way to interpret what we read in God's Word, and so many have no idea how to approach God's Word. If, if they've even read it, but most of today's Christians don't even read it, so it's not like hermeneutics matters a lot, but Christians are all over the map, and it's because they don't understand the basics of how to read their Bible. They don't understand hermeneutics. They don't understand simple Bible interpretation. Here's a test for you. Let's read a verse that says the following. Okay, this is a verse from the Bible. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you'll just fall down and worship me. Wow. And all those things he was going to give, they were wonderful. I mean, they were all the kingdoms of the earth at the time. He said, All you have to do to get all these things is just fall down and worship me. You can have it all. If Jesus is speaking, if Jesus is speaking and he showed you all of the earth's kingdoms and he said you, yeah, you, you know who I'm talking about. You could have it all. If all you did was just fall down and worship him, then that might get your attention, right? Yeah. So this verse, this verse that says, I mean, it's, it's this guy talking and he says, and he said to him, all these things I'll give you if you'll just fall down and worship me. The problem was who said it. It wasn't Jesus who made that promise. It was Satan. Satan promised all the world's riches to this guy if that man would only choose to worship Satan. Now, don't you think this is a great example that the speaker is critical to pay attention to? Who is speaking is so important to know. I mean, isn't that just fundamental? You shouldn't go around quoting verses without paying some attention to who's speaking those verses. We saw last week in Podcast 8, and oh, come on, wasn't Podcast 8 the best one so far? (laughs) Dexter, he's my sound guy. He thinks it's the best so far, and I sort of agree with him. You should should just listen to it. You should listen to Podcast 7 and 8 before listening to this one if you haven't. But last week in Podcast 8, I mentioned the Numbers 2319 verse that says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. And many people say this verse proves that God doesn't repent because God is not a man. Now, God's not a man. Maybe God doesn't repent, or maybe he does repent, but don't quote Balaam, a false prophet, for your proof text. The same with this promise of the kingdoms of all the earth. It was Satan making this promise. So not only do you not use this as your proof texts of anything, you never, ever, ever quote it as a good thing. And by the way, He was speaking to Jesus at the time. And let me assure you, Jesus listening to Satan tell him this, making him these promises, let me assure you that Jesus sure took the one speaking into consideration. Jesus took the fact that it was Satan talking into consideration. And don't you want to be more like Jesus? What about the Jews when God spoke to them in Jerusalem? Isn't that the same instruction that we today, whenever God would give the Hebrews a command to wear certain clothing or eat certain foods, isn't that the same instruction that we should obey today? 
Now that Jesus was born, died, and rose from the grave in between now and then, are we today to obey those same dietary laws that the Hebrews obeyed? Again, we shouldn't just only look at who is speaking, but when we read our Bibles, we need to look at who is being spoken to. All of the Bible is for us, but not all of the Bible is to us. Are we Jews today? Are, are You and I, are we Jews today? You know, wearing those little hats on our heads. You know what those little hats they wear, those Yamahas? Are we Christians today? Or do we have a different set of instructions from those Yamaha-wearing uh, Hebrews? Right. We're not Hebrews. In Galatians 3.28, Paul says there is no Jew or Gentile today in the body of Christ. So we're not wearing any Yamahas on our head if we know what we're doing. So, let's get back. Wait. What? No, Dexter. He's my sound guy. He says those little hats that the Jews wear are not called Yamahas. Yes, they are, Dexter. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay, folks, back. What? What now, Dexter? I'm sorry. He's insisting they aren't called Yamahas. Go ahead and tell me, Mr. Know-it-all. What are those little hats that Jews wear if they aren't called Yamahas? Yeah, just say it into my earpiece. I'll tell the, I promise, I'll tell the audience. They're not Yamahas. What are they? I'm so sorry. He says they're called Hondas. See, this is the problem with having a sound guy who knows nothing about Jewish culture. Hondas. Come on. Please forgive Dexter. He's my sound guy, but he obviously doesn't know what he's talking about. So back to hermeneutics. When two people read the same Bible passage but come away with two totally different meanings, which, by the way, happens all the time, there are only two possibilities. Either both are wrong, or one is correct and the other is wrong. Get that? They cannot both be correct. If you and I read the same passage and we come away with two totally different meanings, the opposite meanings, we cannot both be correct. We might both be wrong. One of us might be wrong and the other might be right. But when two people disagree on something, you cannot both be right. That's the problem. You should never respectfully disagree when it comes to disagreements about morality and God's word. To, to do so is to agree that being wrong when you interpret the Bible is acceptable. That's not acceptable. When two people walk away from identical verses with different conclusions, the problem is due to a difference in hermeneutics in the way they interpret the scripture. One, for example, may have spiritualized away a literal statement, and that means he read into a verse more than the verse actually said. Now, if you want to know how to study your Bible better, a short study about hermeneutics, which we've been doing, is so important. Well, it's not just important. It is your responsibility to learn about hermeneutics if you're a believer. Do You see, it's a proper understanding of what God tells you is your responsibility as a believer. If you ignore hermeneutics because it sounds like something hard to understand, then every time you read your Bible, you risk being a fool. Proverbs tells us a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only expressing his opinion. So, for a fantastic book, let me tell you about it. I know I didn't write it. It's even an exciting introduction to hermeneutics. You ought to read this thing. It's called, are you ready for this? It's called, we'll provide a, a show note link to it. It's called, Prolegomena on Biblical Hermeneutics and Method. Boy, those are some big words. Prolegomena on Biblical Hermeneutics and Method. I mean, yeah, it sounds kind of horrid. I mean, not like a book you're, you know, it sounds almost like a book you were forced to read in college, but it's not horrid. It's somewhat remarkable. Prolegomena is somewhat remarkable in my opinion. It's easy to understand. And yes, there's even a Logos Bible software version available. Yay! So, I have coined a few hermeneutical models. So have other people. And in this book, Prolegomena, it also coins the best one, actually. I'm going to save it for last. But coined too late to be included in that book that Dr. Christopher Cohn wrote, too late to be included in the book on hermeneutics called Prolegomena, are these two new hermeneutics. Now, I was not the sole author of the first one, although I did hone it to perfection. Okay, some uh, An acquaintance of mine in Colorado, I think, came up with it, but maybe not. Anyway, it's called the eight-year-old hermeneutic. Here it is. Ask an eight-year-old, what does this verse mean? Almost always, he will tell you what it means. You see that an eight-year-old isn't educated enough to spiritualize away obvious meanings. It takes a master's degree in theology, or actually a serious reading of several dead Germans, to become stupid enough to not believe what the Bible clearly says. So, if you don't understand what a verse means, one hermeneutic says, 
the eight-year-old hermeneutic says. Just ask an eight-year-old. Now there's a corollary that I developed scientifically in the lab. It's called the eight-year hermeneuticals corollary. And this corollary is stated as follows. If the eight-year-old is home educated, the hermeneutics accuracy rate increases 518.42%. So if you don't know what something means, ask an eight-year-old home educated student, and they'll generally just read it and tell you. Now there's another hermeneutical model that you need to know. It's called the Neo-Christianized Hermeneutic. And here's the definition, the Neo-Christianized Hermeneutic. Here it goes. This is one I wrote. This is one way to hear others and then interpret what they're saying. Understand how they interpreted what they're saying. Here it is. The Neo-Christianized Hermeneutic. If most Christians say it, it's probably wrong. Okay? So if most Christians are going around saying don't judge, well, it's probably wrong. If most Christians go around saying love the sin or hate the sin, it's in the Bible, well, they're wrong. Okay? If most Christians say it, it's probably wrong. Now, there is another corollary that goes with this hermeneutic. So, the neo-Christianized hermeneutic corollary number one is, in most cases, the more often a Christian quotes a verse, the less likely it's in the Bible. Okay? Kind of like that hate the sin, love the sinner mythology garbage. The more often they say it, the less likely that's in the Bible. And We learned, I think all the way back in podcast two, that yeah, that's not in the Bible. Even the concept is wicked. We proved without a doubt. Here's the third hermeneutical model. This is another way to study the Bible. Another way to interpret the Bible. And here it goes. It's called the anthropomorphic hermeneutic. Now you don't even have to know what anthropomorphic means. Don't even worry about that. Most people who use it all the time, they don't know what it means. I do, but I'm not going to tell you. It just doesn't matter. What's important to this strange group of people is that they always describe the anthropomorphic hermeneutic whenever they're challenged. Okay. Here it goes. When they say something really silly, like they quote Balaam as a true prophet instead of a false one, and you question them about it, they always respond with the following. Oh, that's an anthropomorphism. You get that? I, I'll, 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 I'll say that again. Oh, that's an anthropomorphism. Now, a lot of times they like to add a lot of haughtiness to it. Kind of like, oh, that's an anthropomorphism. Now, in addition, if they can't explain something in the Bible, they'll always explain it away with the anthropomorphic hermeneutic which goes. Now, repeat after me. Oh, that's an anthropomorphism. Okay? So, if they say something really silly and you challenge them, then they will say that. That's the way, that's their hermeneutic. They, they don't know the answer. So, they respond with, that's an anthropomorphism. That's the way they interpret their Bible. They just say this. They've been taught to say this. Now, if they can't explain something in the Bible, and they think they're really smart people, but if they can't explain something, they will say, oh, that's an anthropomorphism. Now, again, you don't have to know what anthropomorphism is. You only have to say the word anytime your view of Scripture is challenged or anytime somebody asks you to explain something that you have no idea what you're talking about. You just throw that out at them. That's what these group of people do who read the Bible and interpret it using the anthropomorphic hermeneutic. Now I have no doubt you've heard of the infamous. I'm, I'm, go, I'm moving on because who wants to spend time with those people? I have no doubt you've heard of the infamous world-shattering seminary correcting hermeneutic. The classic hermeneutic called the clarity hermeneutic. You have heard of the clarity hermeneutic, I'm sure, right? It's the classic hermeneutic called the clarity hermeneutic that I just made up. And it goes like this. If the Bible plainly makes a clear statement, a Christian will go out of his way to cloud the meaning of the words. Got it? Okay, this world-shattering, world-famous, classic seminary correcting hermeneutic, the classic hermeneutic called the clarity hermeneutic that I just made up says, if the Bible plainly makes a clear statement, a Christian goes out of his way to cloud the meaning of it all. Think about Revelation. Almost everyone agrees that the book of Revelation, or as we say in Oklahoma, Revelations, can't be understood. I mean, almost everybody's wrong most of the time, right? That's what our, our, our second hermeneutic said. If everyone says the book of Revelation is, is hard to understand, they're almost always wrong. Now, the meaning of the book of Revelation written by John. Revelation. Now, a lot of people say it's very difficult to understand. The original Greek word for Revelation, we transliterate it. That means we look at the Greek word, we hear how someone says it in Greek, and then we kind of make an English word from it. We call it apocalypse. Apocalypse. That's basically the Greek word for Revelation. Now, if we look up what apocalypse means, it means unveiling or revealing. 
okay? It means revealing something. It doesn't mean hiding something, okay? Re revealing. Apocalypse means not hiding. It does not mean, revelation does not mean making something harder to understand. So in other words, John's book of Revelation is to expose and reveal and explain and show what's going to take place someday. Our God, who inspired John's words, is not a God of confusion. So man says Revelation's hard to understand. God says Revelation is revealing and that it uncovers what was hidden before. Now I wonder who we should listen to more, man or God? Let me see. Man or God? Man or God? Man or God? What about those scorpion monsters in Revelation 9? It contains some nasty things. I'm going to read a little bit of Revelation 9, okay? I'm going to boldface in the microphone. That means I'll just talk like it's boldfaced. The words we're really interested in, okay? Here it goes. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. And the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth, they were like teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like sounds of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months. Now what in the world could all that mean? I have a friend who asked me the other day about this last line, tails like scorpions. He said, did I think these were actual giant scorpions, or is it an analogy? Now, for, for example, an analogy, it's like a figure of speech to describe I mean, maybe John was describing poison coming out of men's mouths in the last days as being as bad as a scorpion sting. I mean, maybe that's what John meant. So which is it? Is it a real monster, a regular sized scorpion, or just a man? How could we possibly ever know that? Well, we could just read it, okay? The ancient and world famous hermeneutical method that I'm going to teach you now, it's called the look up and down hermeneutic. You've probably heard of it, the look up and down hermeneutic that I recently made up. And it goes like this. Anytime lots of people argue over scripture, usually right above or below the question verses, God has explained everything clearly. Look up and down hermeneutic. If you don't understand a verse, just look up or down and probably God just explains it all. It's kind of a context type of hermeneutic. When you read something you don't understand, look at it in context. But it's even easier. You just look up or down and God's probably telling you what it means. So here it goes. Just as he does here, God tells us the words used for scorpions are similes. They're similes. Oh boy, I'm sorry. To all the public school English teachers out there now are so confused. A simile makes a comparison between two words using like or as, okay? So whenever you're comparing, or if you're saying um, time flies like an arrow, that's a simile because it uses the word like to compare two things. It's useful to determine just how close a simile might be. Now we have good reason to think that these aren't actual giant scorpions, but I think they are large creatures that aren't too different from scorpions. Somehow they're also like locusts, perhaps in the way they fly and first appear. Or perhaps they are locusts that have mutated into giant locusts with stinging tails. But you see, God uses a simile here. He doesn't just make one up like that guy I went to college with years ago, willy-nilly. God's not, he doesn't make it up willy-nilly. God wouldn't describe them as locusts and like scorpions if they were far different from locusts and scorpions. Get it? I think we can easily gather that these are big things, perhaps large man-made monster demons, with some way of inflicting actual stings, likely with a tail of some kind that's very much like a scorpion's. Look. Now we can argue all day what this means. They have tails like scorpions and stings. I'm, I'm quoting God here. They have tails like scorpions. 
Well, that means they have tails like scorpions. What in the world does that mean? It means their tails sting like scorpions. But why do we need to argue? Why do we need to say Revelation's hard to understand? God's telling us through his inspired words exactly what those things' tails are like. They're like a scorpion's. They sting like a scorpion, only instead of the short-term pain inflicted by an actual scorpion, this lasts for five months, and oh, it's bad. These people who get stung, they want to die, but they can't. Why in the world can't they? They will long to die, but death flees from them, we are told by John's words in Revelation. So these creatures, are they actual scorpions? No, we don't have to even argue that. God says they're like scorpions, though. Now, how much are they like scorpions? Well, very much so. They've got tails that sting. Now, is all this really an analogy for something else? I mean, are these actually big Sherman tanks going around killing people? How can, on earth can you conclude that from this verse, from this set of verses? This is very clear text, although it does use some similes. It says, like scorpions, but these are monster bugs or something. Revelation is revealing after all. We need to stop acting as though Revelation's cloudy and unclear. We, we just perhaps should just read it if we want to know what it says, if we want to know what's the case. God, God will tell us. But how close of a simile or metaphor? Perhaps we need to consider reading it, as I demonstrated above, to see how close it is. Because right after he described these things, he started using the word like a scorpion. It's all fairly easy. It takes years of reading a bunch of dead Germans to cloud your brain enough to stop believing what God's word clearly says. So I'm going to come back to our famous hermeneutic, the hermeneutic interpretation method called, you know, the classic method, look up and down hermeneutic. Often if a verse or a passage confuses you to understand what it means, you look one to three verses before and one to three verses after that confuses you. That's the explanation. We don't have a God of confusion. We have a God who's the greatest communicator in the universe. But back to the idiots. The theologians who argue ad infinitum, asking themselves, Oh, in light of Ephesians 4.30, how can someone actually grieve the Holy Spirit? I mean, they actually ask things like that. How, in, in the light of Ephesians 4.30, how can someone actually grieve the Holy Spirit? Because using the famous look up and down hermeneutic, we don't have a problem with it. Okay, So get out your classic look up and down hermeneutic that I just made up recently. And let's look it up. First travel three verses. Okay, get it. Ephesians 4.30 talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. So a first question we ask, and it's a reasonable question, well, how can we do that? Well, look up two or three verses. Just four verses earlier in Ephesians 4.26 through 29, God says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So, how do you grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, the four verses leading up to that verse that says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, tells us, don't let the sun go down on our anger. If you steal, stop and start working for a living you can share what you earn with someone else. Don't let unwholesome words proceed from your mouth. He's telling us exactly how we can stop grieving the Holy Spirit and obviously implying how we do grieve the Holy Spirit. You might recall I told you earlier in this podcast about Dr. Cohn's book, Prolegomena, and at the, the core of his teaching is a consistent application of a hermeneutic, which really is the best hermeneutic. It's called the Literal Grammatical Historical Hermeneutic. I'm going to say it again because this is the best hermeneutic to know in the history of the universe. It is the literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic. And it sounds hard, and when I tell you what it is, you'll see, oh, it's, it, it's, it's almost like the eight-year-old hermeneutic, almost. This hermeneutic says, take the Bible literally. Certainly some things in scripture are metaphors, as we saw. What in the world are those flying things? Are they scorpions? No, but they're like scorpions, so we can kind of envision what they look like. Certainly things in scripture are metaphors and analogies and parables that use one thing to illustrate another truth. But that other truth is often a spiritual truth. And in spite of metaphors and analogies and parables that do exist in the Bible, the literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic says the following. Let's first and foremost just assume the Bible means what it says. And let me tell you folks, this is the best hermeneutic you will ever learn. This is the way you should interpret every word you read. You should assume the Bible means what it says. Then, if we read certain passages and we find that God's giving us an analogy of some kind, that's fine. We're smart enough to know that's an analogy. 
It's going to use like or as if it's a simile. That's comparing two things. But he's not comparing two opposite things. First we assume what God says is literal and it grammatically means what it says. Another approach to understanding scripture is not that. It's all the other ways I've been talking about actually spiritualizing them away. Saying, well the words say one thing but actually God means totally something else. Well that's foolish. So let me ask you a very key question. Are you smarter than one of the Bible writers who were inspired by God? I don't consider myself smart enough to spiritualize meanings in most passages. I mean, that's why I prefer to take the Bible literally until further notice. And Dr. Cohn's book, he really brought that home for me. Think about Noah. Noah used a literal hermeneutic to understand God's word. Noah used a the. He used the. He listened to God and interpreted the God's words literally, grammatically, and historically. God said to Noah. God is speaking to Noah. He said, Noah, build a boat. Noah said, okay, and he built a boat. That's pretty clear. That's what the literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic is. God told Noah, build a boat. Noah built a boat. Noah didn't try to spiritualize away everything. He didn't start analyzing all the things God could have possibly meant. What did God mean when he said, told me to build a boat? I mean, if Noah had a time machine and looked forward to learn all about Greek philosophy, he could have guessed, oh, that boat was actually an anthropomorphism for Noah swimming in the sea of sin all around him. Noah could have gone further and he could have guessed that when God repented that he made man. God said that back in Genesis 6. He repented that he made man. Noah could have just guessed. He could have listened to the Greek people, the philosophers, Plato and all those guys. And he could have said, well, when God said he repented that he made man, that really means he did not repent that he made man. That's what the Greek philosophers would say and the people who still worship them. It takes a really smart Greek philosopher to say that what God says is the opposite of what he means. No, actually, it takes a real stupid Greek philosopher, such as Plato or Aristotle, to say something that ignorant. To say that God says one thing and means the exact opposite. I, personally, you know I'm smart. Just ask me, I'll tell you. I am, I am so ignorant about things that I never think God means the opposite of what he says. I just am not as smart as those Greek guys or a bunch of dead Germans. So if God says he repents that he made man way back in Genesis, here's what I think he means. I think he means he repents that he made man. Okay? I just want to take God at his word. So the historical part of historical, the, the literal grammatical historical hermeneutic. Let me repeat. I've kind of had fun with hermeneutics throughout this podcast. I've told you about some that are just silly, but people use them anyway. But this is the one you need to know. The literal grammatical historical hermeneutic. And it's much easier than its name sounds. It just means the very first thing you do when you read anything in the Bible is just assume it means what it says. Upon further reading, if the verse turns out to be a metaphor, then the Bible makes that clear through the surrounding text. If it's a simile, he makes it clear through like or as. But generally, it literally means what it says. The historical part of a literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic is actually interesting. As an example, the Old Testament, well, it means, what does the Old Testament mean? Whenever it says something, it means what it says. No surprise there, but the historical addition to the hermeneutic, that means that nothing in the future that would or may happen was required to understand or use any scripture given earlier. Okay? People in the Old Testament, they couldn't look forward in time. Actually, I don't think anybody can. That means the New Testament is not required to understand the Old Testament. The Bible is written in a historical context and you have to read it in a historical context. Something in the Old Testament does not change meaning just because we get further revelation in the Greek Bible, in the New Testament. Then the Greek Bible may very well help us see the big picture that was said back in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. The, the Greek Bible, part of our quote Bible, may very well help us see this big picture, but the Greek Bible, the New Testament, was not needed for those to whom only had the Old Testament verses or scrolls. And to drive the, to drive the point home even more, we should always view the Old Testament as helping us understand the New Testament better. Never use the New Testament to understand the Old Testament better. You might have a little bit more revelation ultimately historically in the future, but to understand the Old Testament, use the Old Testament. To understand the New Testament, use the Old Testament also. That was written before historically and it was in the order God intended. And it was written in Hebrew because that's what God wanted inspired. And the New Testament was written mostly in Greek, Koine Greek, because that's what God inspired. 
So my question to you is, what are you going to do if God tells you to build a boat? The Bible means what it says, unless it's obvious it means something else. Oh yeah, Perry, anybody can read anything they want to into the Bible. No, they can't, you fool. You can't just read anything you want into any verse of the Bible. The Bible means what it says. So, if God says in his book, if God says a day is like a thousand years, then he's comparing. He's not defining. He's not defining a day. As a kid, think about this. When you were dreading a shot, okay, you had to go to the doctors to get a shot in room. Time slowed to a crawl, right? I mean, you were in there forever getting more worried by the second. Tears just coming on stronger and stronger. It seemed like years you were waiting for that shot. It was like, it was like 17 hours went by, but it was probably just 10 minutes. Get that? It was like 17 hours, but it was probably just 10 minutes. You were in the waiting room waiting for the shot but as your reward for that shot on the way home. When you got a mint chocolate chip ice cream cone and you started licking that thing, could time had gone by any faster? I mean, it was like seconds went by when you ate that ice cream cone. It was like, oh man, and you started in on it and then it was gone. It was gone in seconds, although it could have been 10 minutes, right? So it was like it only took seconds to eat that ice cream cone, but it probably was more like 10 minutes. Get that? The shot, you probably waited 10 minutes. Probably took you 10 minutes to eat the ice cream cone. But they were both like really different things. So when God says a day is like a thousand years, do you think he's confused? Or do you think he knows exactly what he says? He's simply making a comparison. And today's Christians, they, they really work hard to make the Bible say what it doesn't mean. If you have a lousy worldview and you believe in the mythology of say, evolution. You might think some foolishness, like the creation day, the six-day creation, literally took millions of years. You have to really work hard to come up with that garbage. You have to work really hard to force the word day to mean millions of years. But it happens all the time. So I want you to stop your Herman Munster hermeneutics. Most, the worst, are probably the anthropomorphic hermeneutic guys. They're the biggest examples of users of Herman Munster hermeneutics, but they're infecting more and more formerly good churches every day. But still, all the other hermeneutics, all the ways to read God's Word and make it say the opposite of what it means, or make it say something else, or spiritualize very clear language, that's just horrible. The eight-year-old hermeneutic has a lot going for it, because an eight-year-old will just read the words and tell you what they mean. But you're a little bit smarter than an eight-year-old, I hope. Well, if he's, an edu if he's a home-educated eight-year-old, let's, let's hope you're smarter. So you can understand the historical perspective as well. You can understand context and things like that. Who's speaking? Who's not speaking? So you can read a verse and say, well, let me look up and down. Remember the look up and down hermeneutic? And I can look who's speaking. I can see who's spoken to. I can see, is this written in Hebrew? If so, it's in the Hebrew part of the Bible. And so I can't use New Testament to tell you what this verse means because the New Testament didn't exist then. The Old Testament verses existed by themselves and they are to be interpreted by themselves in that historical context. But if you're asked what a New Testament verse means, feel free to bring in a, a Hebrew text from the Old Testament to describe, to help you support the meaning of that text. That's possible. But if the Bible says what it means and means what it says, that's the easiest way to, to, to read your Bible. People make up these ways of reading their Bible in order to make the Bible say what they want it to say, but they can't do that. It's not unusual for today that Christians think they know more than God or they know better than God, but the reality is they have no idea what God says. If they read their Bibles, which most don't, and most will lie and say they do, but if they read their Bibles, they don't understand the literal grammatical historical hermeneutic. Now, they don't even have to know what that is. They don't have to know what a hermeneutic is. Neither do you. The only thing that's important is God's Word really means what it says. And in, and in general, you read it literally. In general, you read the words and they mean what they say. And if you read your Bible that way, oh, denominations would just melt. They would fall back into a single denomination right and left. They wouldn't, they wouldn't all agree because we're all human, we're all fallen, we're all going to disagree on things, and we're all going to be, when we do disagree, either all of us are wrong or some of us are wrong. But we can't all be right. So you're still going to have some divisions, but the divisions will lessen dramatically if we just believed God, if we just read what he said and said, huh, he must mean that. So let me read to you a few verses from Revelation 20. I'm going to skip one or two, but I'm not going to skip many. I'm basically going to read Revelation 20, one through about uh, six or seven. Okay, here it goes. He laid hold, 
He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word, and they had lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now we're to Revelation 27 already. I told you I skipped a few. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released. Okay, I just read parts of Revelation 20, 1 through 7. And every single time, each verse that I read had the words thousand years in it. And it kept referring back to those thousand years and when the thousand years would be finished. Now, the big question in Christendom these days is, and for end times people, the big question is, what in the world does God mean by a thousand years? What? Well, maybe he means a thousand years. This is a huge argument right now in debates, in times debates. This is a huge argument. There are people like, oh, I won't mention any names, Hank Hanegraaff, who there are lots of people who don't think this means a thousand years. And they come up with these silly end times types of things like the preterists and all this other garbage that said Nero is the Antichrist from 2,000 years ago. All this stuff that they have to make the Bible, they have to lie about the words the Bible is saying in order to make the Bible fit their mold. Instead of just reading what the Bible says and going, well, I guess it means what it says. So my, my task for you as we go forth is I want you to start reading what the Bible says and taking it literally. If you have good reason not to, that a verse means something that's not literal, okay. But until you have that reason, don't assume it means anything but what it says. That is the perfect hermeneutic. God's word means what it says. And this sets us up for the rest of our podcasts. I've done a lot of intro podcasts so far in the first nine of these, okay? Talking about judging and how that's just lied about by today's Christians. Talking about hate the sin or love the sin. That's just completely ripped to shreds by today's Christian who have no idea the origin of that evil phrase and have no idea that that concept's not even in the Bible. Oh, you mean God tells you to hate sinners? No, God never says that. I never said that either. I'm saying that stupid phrase written by that stupid, made famous, I should say, by that stupid Hindu Gandhi who's roasting in hell right now. No, we should not be quoting him as Christians. We've got 31,000 Bible verses here to quote from, and almost all of them make enough sense that you could ask an eight-year-old what they mean, and the eight-year-old's going to tell you. Even better, you can read what it says. Don't not read your Bible because you've been told the lie that it's hard to understand. It's not. The vast majority of the Bible's heart is easy to understand. And you know why that, that mythology's been taught? It's so the people who steal for a living, the government workers, and it's so people who commit vile acts of indecency, the homosexuals and all of those people, they want you to think that the Bible doesn't say that homosexuality is wrong and that it leads to death. They don't want you to believe that. They want you to believe the opposite of that. They don't want you to believe that God intends for a man and a woman to marry each other. They want you to question that. You know those bumper stickers, question authority? Well, what, what, a, what a garbage bumper sticker that is. That's a horrible thing to teach young people, to question authority. Yes, our authority is pretty wicked, but authority is always wicked. Has always been wicked historically, except for a few examples. But still, authority basically is what is telling you don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie, don't murder. That's what authority says. That's what good authority says. Even bad authority says all that. They just don't. They just don't prosecute that unless it's a Christian doing it. And that's fine. Christians, we should be prosecuted by doing those things. That's fine. So, knowing the Bible almost always means what it says. The Bible is very clear about theft, about murder, about marriage. The Bible is very clear on those issues. See, it's those issues that the Bible is crystal clear about. That's what, they're, that's what they really want you to think are cloudy. They don't even know about eschatology and all that other stuff. You know, we're all arguing over what a thousand years means. That's not really what they're talking about, okay? They just want you to question good and bad. 
They want you to believe there is no such thing as, as right and wrong, as good and evil. They want you to just think the Bible is just a big mytholo mythological book. No, the Bible means what it says, and you should always take it literally unless you have an obvious reason with the look up and look down hermeneutic. Look around. Does it say like, as? Is it an analogy? Is it a parable? Unless it's obvious it's not literal, you should assume it's literal. And there you have it. What an amazing teaching, and it's not because of me. It's the teachings that I've, I've set at the feet from other people and learned from that have developed these, these concepts in me and shown me how important it is. Enough to take, before Podcast 10 even begins, before we've got 10 national podcasts out, I wanted to cover three podcasts on hermeneutics. It's that important. So that in the future, when I read a Bible verse to you, you're going to say, huh, I guess that means what it says. And we might discuss if it doesn't, but in general, that'll rarely happen. In general, it always means what it says. So now we can all go forth together. Isn't that exciting? You are now a hermeneutical expert on the Bible. You know more about biblical interpretation, and I am not exaggerating. You know more than 99.99% .99 of all Bible readers today, worldwide. I'm serious. You will no longer use Herman Munster hermeneutics. You'll be accurate for a change. And I want you to be accurate when it comes to God's Word. As we wrap, I want to thank Dexter. He's my sound guy. We want you to keep in mind that someday we'll be going on eternity leave, and when I do, you won't have me to kick around anymore, Buster. But you're going on eternity leave as well, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. But until you do, you have full control of the thermostat when you arrive. You can either order excruciatingly hot or perfect. And let me remind you that stop, drop, and roll doesn't work in hell. You've just been attacked with a force field of truth. Remember, if you're ever unsatisfied with anything we say, you may mail back the unused portion and will gladly say identical or similar material at no additional charge in the future. Please allow six to eight weeks for processing.